Hey, Hope at Home. I'm excited because today we're diving into a brand new teaching series on the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth is such a interesting, um, overlooked, uh, dynamic book that, I mean, honestly, the characters in the book use God's name, but like the narrator in the story doesn't really even talk about God that much. It's such a weird, obscure, often swiped over, only a few pages long, just a few chapters book right after the book of Judges in the Old Testament. And one of the things I love about it is it it's, it's God working in my life in the obscure and the mundane and the everyday. Uh, you hear me say all the time in my walking around, boring, eating, sleeping life, it's God showing up and, and being faithful in the lives of people who make good choices in spite of their bad situations, right? But then it's also got this multi-layered dimension to it that there's this relationship quotient in it, like advice from the pages on, you know, like what's, what's a good husband characteristics? What's a good wife characteristics? Like if you're trying to find a husband, find a wife, what should you look for? Um, what to do when, you know, you're, uh, you've become a widow, what to do when you are too young to remain a widow, what to do when your mother-in-law is giving you advice, but even though she means well, it's not the best advice, um, what to do in hard times, how to live for God and honor God with your lives in the middle of all the messiness that's going on in the lives of the people that were happening in those times. And so let's dive right in. Let's look at these, these, this tale from the, the times before the times even. And let's look at this, this timeless truth and these profound lessons that are truly relevant in you know, today's modern age as well. And when we look at chapter one, and that's where we're gonna start out today, Ruth chapter one, verses one and two, just to kick us off. Um, the, the opening line says, in the days when the judges ruled. In the days when the judges ruled. And the reason that's so important is, if you look at Judges, like verse 21, chapter 21, verse 25, it says, it, it, you know, the book of Judges, it says, in those days Israel had no king, and all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And so, in the days when the judges ruled, what they're saying is, is that there was no king, but there was the, uh, these appointed judges or leaders amongst leaders that were uh, often partnered up with uh, some a, a prophet sometimes but in the days when the judges ruled in other words in the wild wild west in in the time where people did whatever they wanted and whatever they saw fit or whatever they thought was right in the moment in the days when the judges ruled Ruth chapter 1 there was a famine in the land so a man from Bethlehem in Judah together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. So we find an Israelite family that's struggling to survive because there's a famine in Bethlehem. So there's a famine in Israel. They don't have enough food to eat, so they move to Moab. But the problem with this is that Moab is Israel's ancient is enemy. Um, you know, And so when they move, you have a husband, a wife. So you have Elimelech, who's the husband, um, and his name literally means God is my king. Uh, you have his wife, Naomi, which means sweet and pleasant. Um, you have a, a, a son named Milan. Um, his name is sick or sickly. What a great way to name your kid. And then you have Kilon, which means frail or tired. I, I don't know why God is my king and sweet decided to name their kids sick and frail, but, but they did. Um, and, you know, like we have this story unfolding of this family who's looking for an opportunity for better times, and they are making choices that are proce proceed at the time as a necessity. And so you've got, you know, this man, his wife, his two kids, they move to Moab, the Moabite, and then, you know, in the main characters of the story become the, the husband, the wife, the sons, and then the sons marry, marry two women, Ruth and, and Oprah. And, um, you know, Obviously, the, the star of the story becomes Ruth. That's why the book is named after her. But so now that you kind of have some like context of where we're going and what's happening and what's going on, um, I really think that the first lesson 
that we get in chapter one is this idea of learning how to undo what's already been done and how extremely difficult that can be. I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to think about the times in your life that you've made choices and you know, you, you, you're left with this moment where you feel like, well, what's done is done. Like it's too late now. My wife and I, we have a joke that we use that phrase, what's done is done. Uh, it's normally when we're binge watching some TV show in, we're laying on the bed, we're binge watching TV and I'll get up to go get snacks and I'll say, hey, you don't have to pause this. Um, and she already paused it. And so she'll say, what's done is done, right? And, and it became this little inside joke between us. What do, what's done is done is, no, I'm gonna pause it because I care about you. But then it's also, well, it's already paused, so I'm gonna leave it paused. But sometimes in our life, we, we feel like our lives are put on pause. We feel like bad things or situations or circumstances have hijacked our plans and our purposes and, our, and we feel like we're in a, in a moment where we don't know what we're gonna do. This is what's happening with Ruth's family. Um, and, and at this point, it's Naomi's family. They're put on pause because there's a famine in the land and the famine's been in the land for quite some time. And so they wind up having to make a decision to move to a new country, a country that is their mortal enemy, a country that's been at war with them, a country that's caused them lots of problems. And, you know, so this idea of undoing what's already been done when or how to move forward, maybe when your life feels like it's been placed on pause can be a daunting task because normally it's the tough times that get us there. In fact, if you're taking notes, write this down. Tough times can give our temptations way too much power. The truth of the matter is, is that we always have temptations in our lives. But when you're going through tough times, that's when you're more... I don't know, susceptible, more open to giving into the temptation. So when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, that's when you make bad choices, right? Um, when you're worn out and you've been doing a bunch of stuff, when you're emotionally at your end, this is when you look to substances or you look to, to processes to make you feel better. So like when you're weak, emotionally, physically, spiritually, this is when you spend too much on Amazon. This is when you look at pornography. This is when you uh, reach for a donut instead of a salad. This is when you have one too many drinks or decide that you know you can over medicate um, with your prescription meds because well, you're going through hard times. And so you self medicate to make yourself feel better. Why? Well, because you're going through hard times, because you feel like you're not gaining any traction, because you're not getting anywhere, because your life's been put on pause. And so what happens in these moments is things get really rough. Look at it again, verses uh, 1 and 2, Ruth chapter 1. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So the man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Imelech, his wife was Naomi, and the names of the sons were Malon and Kilion. And they were Ephraimites from Bethlehem. So Ephraim, Ephraim was a tribe, one of the 12 tribes. They happened to live in Judah, which is the southern kingdom. And it says, and they went to Moab and they lived there, right? So here's Moab during the famine. And Moab seems to be successful. Moab seems to have food, water. Everybody's doing okay, even though they're not godly people. When we say they're enemies, they're enemies because there's been this problem with Moab from the very beginning. In fact, if you go to the to Psalm, and there's a Psalm 60 that refers to Moab. Uh, Psalm 60 verse 8, it says that Moab is my wash basin. So the, the psalmist speaking in, poetically kind of as God um, is saying, Moab is the place where I store my dirty water. It's my dirty bath water. So when he says Moab is my wash basin, he's saying like, Moab is not a great place. So they've had historical conflicts there um, throughout history, Israel. They've had several conflicts between Israel and the Moabites. Um, you see examples of this in, um, in the time of the Judges. Moab's opposition to Israel is recorded in Judges chapter 3. Um, there's definitely cultural differences. The, Moabs, the Moabites worship their own gods and goddesses, which often clashed with you know, Israel's obvious monotheistic view of Yahweh. Um, that there's territorial disputes. Um, the territories of Moab and Israel were often in close proximity. And so it led to uh, clearly territorial disputes. Um, and then you have the historical conflict um, of, you know, Moab's king Balak attempts to put a curse on the Israelites 
um, through Balaam in Numbers 22 through 24. Um, and then in Numbers 25, you see that the Moabite women are leading the Israelite men into, uh, because they take them as their wives, they're leading them into lifestyles of idolatry. And so, um, you know, there's a, a complicated history of negative relationships between these two nations. And yet, because there's a famine in the land, they put their trust or their faith into the grass is greener on the other side. Um, forget about what we believe. Forget about our faith. Forget about our God. We could go there um, because there it's better. Um, and so they, s they settle for a temporary solution instead of leaning into God for the long-term problems. And so sometimes these hard times can be a little bit hard to shake. It's bad enough that you know, uh, Imelech and Naomi are, you know, have already endured quite some time in dealing with the famine. But if you look at three, three verses, uh, three through five of chapter one, it says, you know, now Imelech, Naomi's husband dies and she's left with her two sons. They marry Moabite women, Oprah and Ruth. After they had had, uh, after they'd lived about 10 years, both Malon and Kilon also die. So Naomi is left without her husband, without her two sons. Um, and so the death of her, of her husband, the death of her sons, they leave no, Naomi in a very difficult situation because in a patriarchal society, you have the matriarch of the family with two daughter-in-laws that she's now responsible for, but no means of owning property, no means of uh, providing no means of anything. And so basically she becomes relatively destitute. Um, and so when I say hard times are hard to shake, I mean, it's already bad. I mean, you ever noticed that? You ever noticed that when the car breaks down, the wash machine breaks down too? Have you ever noticed that when, you know, like when there's already tough times financially, it seems like that's when people start to get laid off. Uh, it, it, it seems like it kind of, it compounds upon itself and you're like, God, well, where are you and what's going on? And it's not that God's doing it to you. It's just, this is life. Like hard times can be hard to shake. And so here's a family that not only have, have endured famine, thought they had a solution, but then the husband and both the sons die. And so now you have a mom and her two daughter-in-laws that are destitute and desperate. And so, you know, in, in verses 6 and 10, you see this idea. Naomi, um, you know, it, it, she's in Moab and the Lord... Um, she heard that Moab, that the Lord had come to the aid of the people providing food for them. And so she had prepared her daughters-in-law to return home from there. So they're saying like she heard, she's in Moab and she hears that Bethlehem now has food, that God's, you know, provided a miracle somehow. And so she takes her two daughter-in-laws and they left a place that they were living and they set out on the road to go back to the land of Judah. And on their way, Naomi says to her two daughters, you, you, you guys should go back to Moab. You should go back to your mother's homes. Um, the Lord will show you kindness as, as you've shown me kindness. Your husbands are dead. I, I don't have a husband. Um, may the Lord grant each of you uh, the ability to find rest and another home from another husband. And so she kissed them both goodbye and they wept. And she said um, to her, uh, we'll go back with you to your people. And so this is Ruth talking. She says, we'll go back with you to your people. Um, and then Naomi says, no, 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 return home, my daughters. Why have you come with me? I'm giving you uh, where I'm going. It's not like I'm going to have any more children um, that could become your husbands. Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I found another husband, is there even hope for me that um, even if I had a husband tonight and I gave birth to two sons, um, you'd have to wait till they grew up to, and remain unmarried until to marry them. Um, and he, she just says, no, my daughters, you know, you've got to go back. It, it's, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand is against me. And they wept aloud. Oprah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. And when I say this, that, you know, the idea that hard times are sometimes hard to shake, but, but our choices help us take back control. I don't know if you've ever felt like your life was completely and totally out of control and that things were beyond your ability to take care of. It's obvious that Naomi 
and Ruth and Oprah had no ability to control the famine. They had no ability to control whether their husbands died or not. But in the moment when they were at a crossroads, the two daughters were given a choice. Go back and try to go back to your hometown instead of following me back to my hometown. And maybe it'll work out for you. And one daughter makes the choice, Oprah, to go back the way she came. And the other daughter says, no, you're my family now. I'm going to stay with you. And there is power in choice. There is power in the choices that we make. And the choices that we make in our everyday walking around, boring, eating, sleeping life have have outcomes and consequences, um, both good and bad, that, you know, naturally play out when we make the choice. This is why, you know, saying, well, I had no choice in the matter is can be true. But there are times where you definitely had choices. You know, Oprah made her choice and Ruth made her choice. And those just choices play out differently. Now, we don't really know long term what happens with Oprah's choice. But we'll find out as we follow the story over the course of the next few weeks together how how Ruth's choice plays out. Ruth clings to her mother-in-law. Ruth stays with her. In fact, look at verse 16. Ruth replies, Um, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if death separates you and me. Um, And then Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her. And so she stopped urging her to go back to Moab. You know, Ruth is showing this remarkable loyalty to her mother-in-law who socially would not be required to do so. It would have been socially acceptable for Ruth to just go, yeah, I should go back to my hometown and find a husband to take care of me because I'm already 10 years past my prime. says that she was married for 10 years in Moab. So I'm already 10 years past my prime. Um, as far as being a young married woman. And so uh, it's already going to be hard enough. There's been a famine in the land all around us. I should probably go back. It's going to be more likely that I'm going to find a husband from where I'm from than if I go to Israel or to Bethlehem um, to be a part of what Naomi's going back to do. But she shows this loyalty not only to, to Naomi, but she also chooses Yahweh. She chooses the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? She chooses the God of second chances and new beginnings. She chooses the God of her mother-in-law, even though there may have been times where, you know, they weren't necessarily participating in traditional worship of Yahweh in the way that the Israelites would. She chooses. And so she makes her choice. She makes her choice with Naomi. She makes her choice with Yahweh. And she goes back to Bethlehem with her. It's a beautiful kind of story. So the two of them, as they return back to Israel together, um, you know, it, it makes me think of this concept or this idea, like if if you want to get to the right place that God has for you, then you're going to have to do everything within your power to leave the wrong one that you're in now. You know, I know that maybe in your circumstances, in your situations, at the time, it seemed like a good idea for you to leave God's place for you, your Israel, as it were. And head to Moab because Moab seemed like it had the answer. And that could be marriage relationships. That could be addiction issues. That could be relationships. It could be jobs. It could be neighborhoods. Like maybe you found yourself like, well, I knew that I was supposed to be here at this church doing what God called me to do. But I left because houses were cheaper there. Or I knew that um, I shouldn't really date that guy. But, you know. The guys, there was no other guys around me and I was tired of being, you know, alone. So I went ahead and dated a guy who wasn't good for me because somebody who wasn't good for me is better than nobody. Or, you know, I I really didn't feel like I was supposed to take that job, but man, they offered me so much money that I had to take it, right? And so you leave Israel and you go to Moab because it seems like the grass is greener in Moab. But once you get to Moab, you, you find out that, you know, like you're there and you're all by yourself. You're lonely, you're scared, there's no covering, there's no protection anymore. And so for you to get back to the place that God has for you, you've got to leave the place that you were at. And so these difficult decisions that we make, 
you know, yes, our choices help us to make the best of bad situations, but our commitments take back the power in our everyday lives. Like when you make a commitment like Ruth makes to Naomi and Ruth makes to God in that moment, she's taking back control of the narrative of her story. And she's saying, no matter what happens next, I chose this and I'm going to be in control of the story because I'm choosing you, mom, and I'm choosing your God to be my God. Um, and so whatever comes next, it's because I made this choice, not because life came at me hard and fast, not because these things were out of my control or what's done is done. And so she's taking ownership of her story. And it's a powerful moment when you think about taking ownership of your story. In other words, if she's going to leave her mother-in-law and just go back to Moab, well, then she's just defaulting to what she already knew. Instead, she's saying, I'm choosing this grand adventure of following God. I'm choosing this grand adventure of going with my mother-in-law. I'm choosing loyalty and kindness and compassion. I'm choosing the God of kindness and compassion over these pagan gods that I grew up with. And so this decision that she makes, it changes the whole trajectory of her life. I want you to think about that right now. I want you to think about the one decision that you could make today that could change not only the trajectory of your life, but the trajectory of your children and your children's children. You, you realize that the legacy that you leave is based off of the choices that you make. And when we say choices that you make, it's not just the choice, but the commitment to that choice. Like you could change everything in an instant today by choosing Jesus. You could change everything in an instant today by choosing righteousness, but you could change everything in an instance today by choosing forgiveness and second chances and new beginnings. But really it's about you making the choice and then you making the commitment to own up to that choice and follow that choice to its completion. Are hard times going to happen? I guarantee it. Could there be another famine? Probably. But knowing that you're where God wants you to be, even if in the season it's not exactly where you want to be, is way more powerful. You know, I tell people this all the time um, as a pastor over my career of doing ministry. Um, people have said to me, you know, like, well, I feel like it's time for me to move on to a different church. And normally when people say that, I'm going to be honest with you, um, it's a little bit of a cop out. Um, they they have their feelings hurt or, or they're just looking for something different or uh, they don't want to be held accountable. Uh, they want to continue in a life of sin unchecked. And so they feel like they say if they spiritualize the con conversation, God's calling me somewhere else, that it somehow gives us nothing to say about it. We just have to let them go with it. And so what I've learned to say over the years is, well, I want you to be where you want to be and where God wants you to be. And my prayer for you is that it's the same place. Because I do believe that God does call us to very specific places and spaces for seasons. Don't get me wrong. But I think most of the time in our modern day, convenient Christian lives, um, we, we make easy the easy choices um, the convenient choices, comfortable choices, even though the hard choices are where we unlock the power of God in our everyday lives, where our faith awakens. And so Ruth makes a hard choice, a hard choice to follow Naomi back to a land that she knows nothing of, um, to be in a place or a space where she might be considered an outcast, definitely a foreigner, definitely an immigrant, definitely a refugee, um, where she would be low on the cask system because she has no husband but she did it because she felt like it was the right thing to do even though it was the harder choice but that one decision that one choice that one commitment to do what is right could change the whole trajectory and the whole legacy of the life that you live i wish that in this teaching series i could put a little bow on the end of each lesson right but you're just gonna have to come back next week because the story unfolds over the course of the next six weeks together. And so I want to leave you with this prayer. And, and I just want to challenge you to be reflective about your choices and your decisions as I pray for you right now. Lord, as we reflect on the lesson from this story in Ruth chapter 1, Lord, we, we come before you with our hearts and our minds open. Help us to grasp the significance of choices that are being made, not only by these characters, but in our own lives and how these stories how they transcend time and the truth of them apply to us today. 
Lord, may your wisdom guide us as we navigate through our own journeys and we try to find our way from Moab back to your house, Lord, back to your your proverbial Israel in modern day times, Lord. And would you align us, our decisions and our choices and give us courage to follow your will, God, not just our agenda. Lord, and empower us to extend grace and loyalty to those around us, just as Ruth has exemplified this in her relationship with Naomi. Let us make good decisions, even if they're hard decisions. And as we reflect in this moment right now, Lord, let it be a catalyst for transformation in our lives, in our communities, and in the world. We praise you and we thank you for who you are and that you are our God, even in hard times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.